we are for this weekend, we're going to be actually in Luke chapter 17, uh, verses 11 through 19. And the title of the message is, Thank Him on Your Way. Let's pray. Well, Lord Jesus, uh, we come before you just even as the song said this morning, you are so good. And Lord, I pray that each day um, and every opportunity we have that we would recognize your goodness. God, that your mercy endures forever uh, in and over our lives. And uh, Lord, we want to take this opportunity to look into your word and this opportunity, Lord, to to really and truly thank you for for who you are in our lives. Uh, Not just what you've done, Lord, but who you are. We love you indeed. And all God's people say, amen. So I want to... I want to say thank you for your prayers. Kathy and I are so thankful for just the the prayers and love that has been poured out from the church body for the birth of our second child, our daughter, who, by the way, was born on November 4th. So you're probably wondering how all this went down because we were here for both services that morning and we were so blessed because you all just stretched your hands forward towards us and prayed. And I think you just prayed the induction of labor. I mean, it just like, it was just time. And, and so that was her due date was the fourth. And so here's how it went down. Kathy left from here. I stayed until the building got shut down. And on my way home, I received a phone call from Kathy and she was saying, how close are you? Um, because I'm close. And I knew exactly what that meant. And so as soon as I got home, we loaded up, packed up the car, got everything ready, and then we headed off to the hospital. And so uh, that was around 2.30, and we were at the hospital until Sadie was born at 10.57 on the 4th. And that's little Sadie. Yeah. She's a, she's a real sweetheart, and I look forward to you all being able to meet her and for us and for her to be a part of this church body. I know she will be blessed uh, to grow up uh, amongst people like you. You know, there were so many things that going into it the second time we, we kind of anticipated and other things that, that went completely differently. And throughout the day, we were just so uh, much you know, you're heightened, your emotions are heightened, everything's heightened, and you're just looking forward to this child being born. And so there were some things, you know, we figured that we knew what was going on. But one of the things that we didn't expect that was completely different and actually caused our our, our hearts to sink in a moment was uh, we're going through the delivery. And as soon as she was born, uh, the nurses took her, they give her to mom immediately, and we're kind of waiting for this moment where she'll cry. And I, I missed the opportunity with Eli to get that on video. And so I'm like fumbling through my phone, like trying to get this on video, you know, so that we can think about that and, and, and recall that. She would never want to look at it, but we would because it's so sweet. And so I'm trying to get all, the, all of these things together and there's all of this stuff going on. And as soon as I get this ready and I'm getting ready to get this cry, I just hear Kathy uh, begin praying aloud. And she's saying, please, Lord, uh, let her breathe. And for an extended period, I believe it was over two minutes, uh, Sadie didn't breathe. And they took her off of mom and they took her over to this table. And of course, uh, my phone went away. And we just began right there in that room, just praying out loud to God. God, we're just asking for you uh, to make a way here. And all of the things that we had thought going into it, all of the, the things that we wanted to go ride and getting this thing on my phone and having that all for us, none of that mattered. Uh, All of a sudden, uh, there was one thing that mattered to us, and it was that she would begin to breathe. And uh, after two minutes, they they were calling in doctors and nurses to come and help the situation. And all of a sudden, she began to breathe. She began to cry. And we've never been uh, so thankful. You know, it's those little things that you become thankful for in those moments, and you realize that. And not only were we, we calling out to the Lord right there in the, the hospital room, as soon as she began to breathe, we began thanking the Lord right there in that hospital room. We tried to do that just as loudly. In the moments that followed, we were so thankful for the opportunity that we had had earlier in that day uh, to be prayed over by all of you. And, and we don't believe that it's anything small. We believe that the Lord uh, heard our prayers that morning, and so we have been blessed. 
This morning, we're going to look in Luke chapter 17, and we're going to look at 10 lepers uh, who cried out to the Lord. And when they cried out to the Lord, he sent them on their way and they were healed. They loudly cried out to him as loud as they could. But once they were healed, there was only one who came back equally or more loudly and thanked the Lord. If you would, please read with me in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When, they, when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said to him, were there not 10 cleansed? But the nine, where are they? But no one, was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go, your faith has made you well. These 10 lepers, they cry out to Jesus, uh, come to Jesus asking for mercy. We went through Matthew chapter 8 recently, and we talked about in chapter 8 how there was a leper who came to Jesus to approach Jesus and asked for the Lord's mercy in and on his life. And we know that what Jesus did when that leper came to him was Jesus reached out and touched that leper. So in that moment, he touched a man who was in society untouchable. And he extended his hand to him and he touched him and he was healed immediately. No doubt from stories like that and, and, and these people throughout the region knowing that there was a man who could heal, surely the word had spread throughout the region and into the leper colonies. As these 10 lepers come to Jesus, surely they know that there is a man named Jesus who can heal them from what they are afflicted with. They knew this because earlier someone had been healed by that and began to give thanks. We know from Luke chapter 5 that the word about Jesus began to spread all the more after that healing took place. Psalm 105.1 reads this way, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon the Lord, make known his deeds among the peoples. When you give thanks to the Lord in your life, when you make known his deeds among people, among those people who are in your world, at your job, who live in your community, it opens the door for those people to understand that there is a God and that God is good. And your thanksgiving, your giving thanks to the Lord, call upon, calling upon his name and making known his deeds is something that's going to be infectious amongst those who are in need. It provides an avenue whereby those who are standing at a distance, maybe those who have been rejected, maybe those who have been looked down on or separated in society to come before Jesus to draw near just as you and I perhaps have done in our life, as we drew near to Jesus rather than standing at a distance, it allows others to draw near to him as well. As Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, he enters into a village. And in that village, there are 10 lepers who are standing off at a distance. No doubt they understood that the man who was walking into their village was a man who could do something about what they were afflicted with. Yet they still remained at a distance because of what their affliction meant. Because of what their disease meant, they remained at a distance to him. Now surely they had known that Jesus touched a man just like them. Yet there were societal norms, there were things that got in the way of them coming and approaching Jesus closely. You see, when it was determined that a man or woman had leprosy, they would be immediately declared unclean. 
they would immediately be cast out, away from family, away from their home, away from the city. And they would have to go into a part of the town that was filled with other lepers. It was called a leper colony. And they would live in a community with other lepers. If they were to leave that community and come into the city, they would have to cry out, unclean. The reason why they would have to call out unclean is so other people could run away from them, so that other people would not come near to them and catch exactly what they had. Uh, The rule in that day and in that time was that if it was windy or there was a little breeze in the air, you had to stay 150 feet away from the leper. If it was a still day, the closest that you were allowed to get was six feet. But we know that even on the still day, people would run away. People would throw rocks at the lepers so that they would not come near them. In scripture, in Isaiah 1, 5 to 6, leprosy is likened to sin. It's a picture of sin in the life of people. In Leviticus chapter 13, we understand that leprosy is a picture likened to sin in many ways. It begins beneath the surface. It spreads throughout the body. A person could and would attempt to hide it for a season. It defiled people. It separated people. And those people who were declared unclean with leprosy would have to move outside of the camp. Jesus had previously shown his willingness to heal and not only heal, but touch a leper. Yet when the lepers see Jesus, they remained at a distance. And they asked him from that distance for mercy. You see, many in this life and many in our world, because of the sin that separates, that we understand from Romans 3.23, Isaiah 59.2, they stand at a distance when it comes to Jesus. And they think only that, that their sin would separate them from a holy God, would separate them from Jesus, choosing only to focus on the first part of that verse rather than reading the second part of Romans 3.23, which says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's by his mercy that we are able to draw near. It's a powerful thing. It's an incredible thing. It's something that we should live with great thankfulness toward that we can draw near to the throne of mercy, that we can draw near to the God of mercy, an incredible gift, one that we can continually thank him for. Hebrews 4.16 reads this way. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. I want to read that again. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find uh, grace to help in time of need. When choosing to draw near to the throne of grace, when choosing to draw near to Jesus, here's the important thing that we have to remember. It's not about our resume. It's not about what we've done. It's about his resume. It's about what he's done. It's about the fact that we're coming to a a God, our Lord, who died for the very purpose so that we might have a way to the Father, so that we might have mercy, so that we may be able to come to him at all times, any time that we have need, to the throne of grace, knowing that we will receive what? Mercy. It's not about where I've been. It's not about who I've been. It's not about what I've done. Rather, it's about who he is. It's about where he's been. It's about what he's done. And because he's made a way for me and for you and for all, we can boldly, with confidence, come before the throne of grace. That's a beautiful thing. The Greek word translated may, it says that we may receive mercy and find grace. The Greek word translated may does not mean might. When you translate that in the Greek text, it means will. It doesn't mean that he might do it. It doesn't mean may in the way that we might say, oh, that may happen. No, it means that we may. It means will. It means you will receive grace You will receive mercy when you approach him, when you draw near to him with confidence and you ask the question, when will I receive that mercy? 
whenever you have need. It says, whenever you have need. And it's more than just a little. He gives mercy. His mercy endures forever, the scripture says. His mercy is more than enough for you and it's more than enough for me and it's available to us when? Whenever we have need. One of the things that Eli and I like to do is we enjoy going to Costco and checking out all of the samples. (laughs) And so, you know, especially as we're getting ready for Thanksgiving, we went last week. I know you're like, big mistake, but here's the thing. If you go to Costco for the samples, the the quality and the quantity just exponentially increases. I mean, every corner that you go to, you can totally go and get your lunch, okay? I'm just telling you. And so we were going around and we're kind of spotting out what was out there. And Eli spotted these crescent rolls that were being served covered in jam. And so he was all about that. So he's like, hey, let's go find those, Dada. So we're kind of going around the aisle and he's getting louder. I want a snack. And I'm like, I know, I want you to have a snack. And so like a good father, we were searching through all of the aisles. We did um, pass go a couple times and grab some different samples. But finally, we found the one where they had the crescent rolls in the jam. And so there's this really long line, you know, and you kind of have to elbow up because people, the good ones, you know, the line gets really long. And so we waited in the line. And then, of course, I'm waiting in the line and he's across the aisle. And I'm one of those people who grabbed two samples and people weren't happy about that either, right? Because they're waiting too. And I'm like, hey, he's right there, kid. I just want to let you know I'm not being, I'm not being greedy here. But I did give both to Eli, and as soon as I gave him those, we went down the aisle just a little bit, and he devoured both of those. And he wanted more. He wanted more of those crescent rolls with jam on them, and so I thought, well, like a good father, maybe we could circle back around. Don't act like you don't circle back around. You're like, this pastor circled back around. No, don't act like you don't circle back around. When it's good, you know, when you know something's good, you circle back around. And so we circled back around. The line was long, okay, and they had the things in the oven. I stood across the aisle for a short time, kind of trying to make eye contact with the person, like, hey, do you think I could come in again? And, you know, I have my son here, right? And, and I kind of, you know, made eye contact with the person, and it was like, not today, buddy. And so we, we didn't, we walked back, you know, by the sample station and we went on and Eli was asking for the snack and I just said, hey, we'll have to figure something else out. And he wasn't super happy about it, but we had already had our share. You see, at Costco, you can't just keep going back for all of these different samples, but with Jesus, not so. With Jesus, you can continue to go back and you can receive that mercy, you can receive that grace. You don't have to stand at a distance. You don't have to stand across the aisle. You don't have to wait to make contact. No, he says, Come to me with confidence and I will give you grace when, whenever you have need. Do you have need this morning? There's mercy for you. That's an incredible thing that he has given to us. Psalm 100, four to five reads this way. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all the generations. Oh, isn't that incredible? You see, the difference with Jesus is that his love, it endures forever. His mercy, it endures forever. His loving kindness forever. And so we can draw near. And with Jesus, there's no need to stand at a distance. There's no need to say, oh, I have this all over me or this is what I've been. No, he says, do you know who I have been? Do you know what my resume is? Do you know what I will give to you? I will give to you life and life abundantly. Mercy is available for us all. He has made a way. There is one with a capital O that you can draw near to. And Micah 7, 18 says, he delights in showing mercy. He doesn't wait here and say, oh, you again. No, the scripture says that he delights in showing mercy. He delights in showing mercy in and over our lives. And so when we approach him with confidence, he's not upset. 
He's not making eye contact with you and saying, not today, buddy. No, he's saying yes today and every day when you have need, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. We just have to come. We just have to come to him. And these 10 lepers surely had not seen mercy from people. They had not seen mercy from society, but Jesus directed them down the path of restoration. And when you draw near to him, despite your burden, he will begin the process of restoration in your life as well. He will point you down the path of mercy. And once you draw near, when you draw near to him, despite what was, when you draw near to him, you come before him, trusting him to do what only he can do. In your life, when we come to him for mercy, we trust him to do what only he can do. He is the only one who can give that grace. He's the only one who can give that mercy. He's the only one who will promote us to eternity. That's who he is. He is good. And Jesus, when he saw them, verse 14, when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, when they went on their way, when they went in the direction that Jesus told them to go, the scripture says they were healed. Jesus responded to the lepers by sending them on their way toward the priest, the one who would have to declare them clean before man. He sent them on their way before they had been healed physically of the leprosy. He just said, go and show yourself to the priest. Start heading toward Jerusalem. Here's the deal. They had seen Jesus heal a man of leprosy before, but the way that he was doing it now was completely different than the way he had done it before. In Matthew 8, when we see Jesus heal the leper, he reached out, he touched the leper, the leper was healed that very moment, it was done. He did what only he could do. The lepers followed his instruction. They headed toward the priest. And as they left the place and made their journey toward Jerusalem, which would be a long journey, they were healed along their way. We don't know at which point they were healed on that journey, but we know that at some point they begin to recognize amongst one another that the leprosy was beginning to go away that they were beginning to be healed. We don't know if it happened momentarily. We just know that they noticed the leprosy was now gone. You know, when it comes to the way in which God does something in our lives, most of the time, we want him to heal the situation before we begin walking. We want him to to do what only he can do, and then we're gonna do our part. We're gonna begin walking down that path. He, however, wants us to start walking, trusting, walking by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. On that faith walk, you will then begin to see that he alone is working. And those lepers, you know, in that moment, they may have been like, (laughs) Jesus, wait a minute. We cried out to you. This is not the way that it's supposed to go. We know what it looks like, Jesus, when you heal a leper. So we cried out to you. Now you come over to us, you touch all 10 of us, heal us immediately, and then we'll go over to the priest and we'll go show the priest. And that's gonna be a great testimony. Jesus, that's the testimony that I wanna bring to the priest. But here's the deal, Jesus. You're telling me, you're telling us 10 that we should begin walking to the priest, but we're still covered in leprosy. What if the leprosy doesn't go away? That would not be a very good testimony for you, Jesus, or for us. So why don't you just do what you're gonna do now so that we all know that it's gonna happen? And Jesus says, no, just start walking. Just start making your way that direction. I'm gonna do what only I can do. But you see, in our lives as well, we wanna do that. We wanna make it, well, Jesus, this wouldn't be a very good testimony if I tell people that I'm still going through the valley. So get me out of here now. And he's saying, no, just start walking by faith. Do what I'm asking you to do. Do what I'm calling you to do. I'm gonna do what only I can do. You just start walking by faith, not by sight. Don't base it upon what you see. Don't base it upon what you don't see. Base it upon me. These days, Eli is really into hide and seek. 
And so as soon as I get home, he either wants to do one of two things. He wants to race me around the house or he wants to play hide and seek. But the way that he plays hide and seek is kind of interesting because he wants to play hide and seek, but he wants to tell me where to hide and how to hide and what he's gonna do when he finds me. Okay, so here's how it will go. It'll go something like this. He'll go, okay, Dada, I'll count. You hide. I'll say, okay, I'm going to go hide. And he'll go, no, Dada, hide right there, okay? (laughs) Hide right there. (laughs) This is what he did last week. And stick your leg out. (laughs) Stick your leg out. And then I'll come find you, and I will tickle your foot. And when I tickle your foot, you laugh. Okay, so I'll hide right here, stick my leg out, you'll tickle me, I'll laugh. Got it. Okay, so then he's counting, you know, ready or not, here I come. Oh my gosh, can you feel the excitement? Like, what is going to happen? Is he going to find me or not? I have no idea. And so he's making his, his way over to me, and of course, you know, then he tickles my foot, and I laugh, you know, I know what I'm supposed to do here, but... But, but here's the deal. Sometimes that's the way that we want it to be with Jesus. Like, okay, Lord, you go right there. You stick your foot out. I'm going to come over and, and I'm going to tickle you. And then you laugh. Like, let me know that you're there. Don't try anything new here, Lord. Don't try to do something new here. Like, I know the way that this is supposed to go down. So you go right there and then I'm going to come to you. And this is exactly how it's going to go. I'd rather not move forward on my journey without this being resolved. I'd rather not move forward on my journey without knowing exactly what's going to happen. And Jesus is saying, walk by faith, not by sight. And we're saying, Lord, stick your leg out so that I can see. And Jesus is saying, hey, you know what? I gave my life for you so that you could see. I gave my life for you. And and greater love actually is, uh, what does it say? It has no one than this, that one lay down his life. He laid down his life. He did so much more than just sticking out his leg or making us feel super comfortable in a moment. No, he is still working. He is still there. He is still going to do what only he can do. But we have to walk that faith walk. He is more than enough. And the truth that God's ways are not our ways is so important to grasp in this life because when things don't go the way that we want them to go or they aren't happening expediently, discontentment and deception can begin to get in the way ingratitude can begin to get in the way. When, when the thing that we want to see happen doesn't happen the way or in the timing that we think it ought, we begin to become discontent. Lord, are you really there? What are you doing here? But what we need to do is we need to trust in the Lord Just like Casey talked about last week, we need to trust in the Lord and not lean on our own understanding but we need to trust the Lord to do what only he can do in a moment. In the book of Joshua, chapters five and six, the the Israelites had just crossed over the Jordan River. They get to the other side and the scripture says that, that, that they were on the plains of Jericho. And Joshua is, is, is bent over, he's, he's kneeling down and he looks up and as he's looking off into the distance, he sees these walls, these inconquerable walls in the city of Jericho. Surely he's probably trying to plot and figure out how now they're going to conquer this next battle. And as he looks up, he sees a man with sword drawn. And the man with sword drawn that he sees, he looks at him and he says, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the man responds to him and he says, no, nay, neither. I'm the Lord. Joshua's response to the Lord in that moment is he, 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 he bows down. And he says, what has my Lord to say to his servant? What the Lord told him to do then was he was going to lead the Israelites around the walls of Jericho for six days. And then on the seventh day, seven times around the city of Jericho, these huge inconquerable walls. And so they would do this for seven days.
Joshua would then go and tell the people what the plan was. Can you imagine that's your plan? We're gonna go walk around the city, these walls. And he says, on the, the, on the seventh day, the seventh time around, then the, the priests are gonna make a large blast of the ram's horns. And then what I want you to do is shout. He says, all the people in the army, I want you to shout when you hear the blast of ram's horns. And when you shout, the walls are gonna fall flat. But he doesn't stop there. Joshua gives one more to the people of Israel. He says, but here's the deal. Until that day, until that time, don't say a word. Stay quiet. God wasn't the one. The Lord wasn't the one when he gave orders who said, tell the people to be quiet. It was Joshua. Joshua knew that Israel had a history of what? Discontentment. When the walls seemed big, they would begin to cry about things and, and get upset about things. And they would begin to, to speak negativity and things into existence. And so Joshua says, do not say a word until I tell you to shout. And when I tell you to shout, you shout. He's saying, uh, don't let a word proceed from your mouth until that day. And so they walk around these walls for six days, seven times on the seventh day, quiet with nothing going except some of these ram's horns. It's not a blast, they're just, they're just playing. And I imagine that as they walked around these walls, the walls of Jericho, each day, each time, each trip around the walls, they just looked bigger. They just looked more inconquerable. They just looked like something that they probably previously would have complained about. But Joshua had given them orders, don't say one word. I believe that the Lord wanted them to understand that this, what he was going to do is something that only he could do. That these walls falling flat wasn't going to be something that they did in their own strength. Rather, they were going to begin walking by faith, knowing and trusting the Lord at his word. Don't speak doubt, Joshua says. Don't speak doubt. Don't pout. Just wait and shout. And in our lives, we have to do the same thing. We can't speak doubt into situations Pout about those situations. Rather, we have to trust the Lord. And when we get there, man, I encourage you, shout. That's that cry. That's that cry of thanksgiving. Lord, thank you so much. You made a way where there was no way. The way and timing of Jesus healing, the way and timing of his restoration, the way that he's going to do that, we don't know. When it's going to happen, we don't always know. Whether it's today, whether it's tomorrow, or whether it's in eternity, but we know one thing, Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes, we've been healed. We know one thing that we look forward to a day that's gonna be so much greater than what we face today. Isaiah 43, 19, behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. And we come before the Lord and we say, Lord, I'm stuck. I'm in the desert out here. I'm in the dry land. Get me out of here. I want to be out of this situation. I want to be out of this circumstance. I don't like what I'm seeing, Lord. And he's saying, you know what? I may not take you out of that situation, but I may transform that situation. In fact, that's what I'm likely to do, to give you streams of living water, to give you rivers in your dry land, Habakkuk 3, 17 to 18, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my savior. Though I got nothing, I will be joyful in the Lord. But you know that discontentment that wants to creep in, that doubt that wants to creep in right from the beginning. It's been there in the Bible. Genesis 3, what happens? The enemy comes to Eve and he says, why can't you have that tree? What's up with that? I think the Lord's holding you back from that tree. I think the Lord doesn't want you to have that tree because he knows how great you're going to be when you have that tree. And begins to speak, oh, surely the Lord didn't say this. 
And this doubt begins to come in. God is withholding God is withholding from you. God is holding you back. Go ahead and eat. Surely you won't die. Actually, you're going to become even greater when you eat from that tree. And we think that we have these things, these trees or whatever they are. And we're thinking, man, I just got to get that tree, that tree. That's my breakthrough. That's my situation. And the enemy wants us to believe that God's withholding us, that he's holding us back from our breakthrough. He doesn't want you to have that breakthrough because he knows that your life is going to be good. If you don't think the Lord wants your life to be good, I have news for you. He surely does. And he made a way for that to happen. He made a way for you to be able to live that way. He's not holding you back. And when the enemy says, make it happen on your own, do it in your own strength. What you have to do is you have to go back to Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. He will make straight paths for you. And as the men, as these lepers went on their way, still covered in leprosy, it would be up to the Lord as to the time of their healing. But their feet were met with their faith as they began to head on that journey toward the place that Jesus told them to go. Be thankful that God is going to do in your life what only he can do. And I would so much rather have what he's going to do than what I could muster up, than the plan that I could put together. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In everything, in difficulty, yeah, everything. Give thanks because that's Christ's will for us. In your life, there are times when Jesus calls you to begin moving in a, direct, in a direction and you aren't quite sure what the outcome will be or when the breakthrough will happen, but know that he's working in a way that only he can. We have to walk by faith and we have to trust in him and we have to keep our entire life in his hands, walking in the direction that he's pointed us to, knowing that he's gonna do what he can do. So choose to give thanks in everything. Because he's good, choose to give thanks in everything. Choose to come before him with with thanksgiving. The lepers went on their way, and as they were going, they were healed, they were cleansed, and the, the disease that they had been afflicted with was now gone. And they continued on their journey. However, there was one of the 10. When he realized what had been done and who had done this for him, He turned around and he went back to Jesus. The scripture says, when he saw that he had been healed, he turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Of the 10 lepers, only one decided to turn around and say thanks once his breakthrough did happen. The other nine journeyed on. The other nine uh, would stand before the priest sooner than the one. Uh, The other nine would be declared clean before man, before the other one. But the one who turned around recognized the importance of who Jesus was and what he had done. That what he had been given was good, but that there was a good giver. And he wanted to turn around to that good giver and give thanks the men who were on their journey had many, many steps that they would actually have to take. When you went back and you went in front of the priest, uh, healed of leprosy, by the way, uh, up until Matthew chapter eight, no one in Israel had ever been healed of leprosy. And there's only two other accounts that we know historically, which was uh, before Israel, where people were healed of leprosy. Anyhow, for Israel, this designation was put in scripture whereby someone would be declared clean, but we don't see anyone coming clean until Jesus came. It was a great testimony to him. Nonetheless, the nine would have to go stand before the priest. There would be uh, more than a week filled with various sacrifices, washings, shavings, all kinds of things. And they would have to process all of this. They would have to go through this process when they went back in to town. All of these formalities, all of these to-dos, all of these things that they had to take care of, their calendar was beginning to fill up. People heard about the fact that they were coming. Their family was waiting on them. And so I'm sure that they were just flooded with the things that they had to do. Now, I don't know if they had thankfulness in their heart. I would imagine that they did. However, even though they had thankfulness in their heart, they did not turn back around to Jesus. 
And sometimes we live our lives with just this general thankfulness. I mean, I, I don't think that, that we're not thankful, but how often are we going to Jesus for the purpose of saying, Lord, thank you? How often are we, we, we turning around in the midst of all the things that we have to do and all the things that we have to take care of and saying, Lord Jesus, thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you. But sometimes we're saying, I, you know, I just want that clean bill of health. I just want that breakthrough here and I'll get that breakthrough. And, and the Lord knows, like he knows my heart. He knows my heart. And you're right, you're completely right. He probably does know your heart. I would argue that he still wants you to say thank you. I think that that's something that, that we see in scripture, give thanks to the Lord. That should be an integral part of our walk as brothers and sisters in Christ. That should be an integral part of, of who we are. Why? Because he laid down his life for us. He did so much more. He did so much more for you and for me than anyone could ever do. And so the man, he, 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 he turns around. He put his life on pause. He would still have to go be declared clean. He would still have to go and figure out all of that stuff, but it was so important to him to turn around to the giver and say, thank you. Of the 10 men who cried out for mercy, they cried out for help. They cried out in their distress. They cried out in their affliction. And the scripture says they did it with a, with, with a loud voice, as loud a voice as they could muster at the time. They cried out loudly, but of the 10, there was only one who turned around and gave thanks loudly. There was only one who showed his gratitude and his thanks for who Jesus was and what Jesus had done. And so I just have a question for you this morning. Is your cry for help and for mercy louder than your cry for thanksgiving? Are you coming before the Father in the times when, 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 when things are good are we a thankful people? Are we thankful followers of Jesus? Are we thankful for what he has done? Are we thankful for the good that happens? I was so challenged in the midst of even this message for me to, to, to do that more, to do that more publicly, to do that more loudly, to do that more openly. And I was even challenged on my social media. Like, I, you know what? I'm gonna go look through my newsfeed and see what I've posted. What have I set on there? Am I just complaining about the world and everything in it? Am I just complaining about the situation or am I coming out here and I say, I'm so thankful for God. I'm so thankful for who he is. I'm so thankful for what he's done. I'm so thankful for this particular situation. Is my thanksgiving as loud as the opportunities that I have to, to ask for change, to ask for a difference? You see, here's the way sound works. the loudest thing supersedes everything else. And when the loudest thing comes out, everything else becomes quieter. When I wear these, these in-ears when I'm leading worship, I, I remember I, I, I played at an event and I, all I could hear was the keyboard. And I'm like, gosh, I just don't wanna hear this keyboard. And so I'm trying to turn everything else up louder. But all I could still hear was the keyboard. And I said to the band leader, I'm like, what is the deal with your sound system? And he came and he looked and he goes, you know what? You need to turn down the keyboard and then you can turn up what you need to start hearing because it's superseding everything in your life. And so my, my challenge to you is not only to thank him on your journey, to thank him on your way, but to turn up Thanksgiving in your life. And when you turn up Thanksgiving, those other things, they begin to be a, just a, a little bit quieter. When we begin to focus on, on, on the fact that the whole world is filled with his glory, we, we begin to do, I, I think it looks a little bit like this. Psalm 136 is a psalm of thanksgiving. And in this psalm, which is 26 verses, half of those, 13 of them say, for his mercy endures forever. So it says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. 
His mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His mercy endures forever. To, to who alone does great wonders. His mercy endures forever. To him who made the heavens with skill. His mercy endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. His mercy endures forever. To him who made the great lights. His mercy endures forever. To the sun and, and, and for the sun to rule by day. His mercy endures endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night for his mercy endures forever. To him who smote the Egyptians in their firstborn, his mercy endures forever. And brought Israel out of their midst, his mercy endures forever. And I believe that that thankfulness walk that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ looks something like that. God, you brought the breath of life into my daughter, your mercy endures forever. God, you've, you've blessed me abundantly beyond measure. Your mercy endures forever. God, you brought me out of that situation. Your mercy endures forever. God, I'm facing it right now, but I know that I can look back and see that you are faithful. Your mercy, it endures forever. His mercy, it endures forever. And if we need to remind ourselves every other line in our life that he is good, let's do that. Amen. Can we just thank the Lord this morning?